Hey, it's Keith Townsend, Principal of the CTO Advisor, and I'm joined today with Alistair Cook, who has served as both my developer and my operations team on this Google Cloud adventure. Alistair, welcome. Thanks, Keith, and it's been a fun little project we've been working on. Yeah, it has been a fun little project. Uh, let's recap what this kind of is and is not. Google Cloud reached out to us to take a look at their automation tools for automating or assessing your environment and then moving your on-premises environment into the public cloud in a way that makes sense. And I think I'll leave the why is this important part up to you. You've, you, you've had years of experience in public cloud providers such as AWS, Google Cloud, et cetera. Why is this even important? I think the most fundamental thing is that we built IT on premises with trying to change applications as little as possible. And we've, we've got virtualization that allowed us to keep these same applications for a long time unchanged. When we take those same applications and try and move them onto the public cloud, it mostly doesn't make sense to leave them unchanged. The best economic outcome and the best business agility outcome is driven by using the cloud native services, not using cloud services as if they were on-premises. And so fundamentally, this is where applications need to be changed to greater or lesser extent as you move from on-premises onto the public cloud if you want to get the best benefits. You can certainly just evacuate your data center and not change anything, but that's going to still cost you quite a lot and not give you this, all of the cloud benefits. Yeah, so all of the both economic benefits and the physical benefits, a aha moment for me throughout this whole process has been, even if we don't change a monolithic application and we're able to put processes into containers, that gives us the ability to auto scale a service that wasn't that couldn't be auto scaled before. We can only vertically uh, move it up. There's some work to be done. It's not magic, but it gives the base capability and gives the SRE team the ability to do this. So overall, let's, you know, kind of put it out there. The, I, I think I've painted this picture that, you know, we have this capability to potentially take a monolith, put it into components of it and into a container and auto scale it. It's not that easy, right? No, and, and generally something that was built to be a monolith, there's a whole lot of assumptions about everything running on one machine. And so generally that, that monolith still has to continue to vertically scale when you move it across. Now, vertically scaling on a container is very similar to vertically scaling on a virtual machine, but you can take away some of the other operational processes around the virtual machine, like having to maintain the operating system when you move across into a container. And so it's another level of ab abstraction of handing over that, the same task that everybody does, right? Everybody patches Windows, Linux using the same processes. That sounds like exactly the thing that should be done at an industrial scale rather than being done by every, every customer, every tenant. And so that's where some of the containerization gives you some benefits around reducing those operational tasks, handing them over to a specialist who does nothing else. So we had a couple of different applications to choose from. We actually run, ran the Google tooling on, on both. There's the, the Obsidian application and the Granite application, essentially the same app, right? Yes, so I, I developed originally Obsidian, uh, sorry, Granite. I originally developed Granite to be a distributed application that ran and generated workload in our data center. And so its objective was just to generate workload across multiple virtual machines, across multiple types of, of resource. And, and that's a good sort of conceptual idea of this distributed application you want to migrate. But we wanted to reflect a monolithic application as well. So I basically consolidated all of those pieces that previously had run across six different virtual machines. I consolidated them all down onto a single virtual machine. And, and that's what Obsidian is. And that was the primary focus in this migration because we wanted to look at monolithic applications, not moving cloud native applications. And we're showing the workflow of this app now. Can you just basically tell what it does? 
So within the application, there's a MySQL uh, server that hosts a, a large collection of tables. There's a group of workers that essentially do lookups against the table, order products out of a catalog. So there's an automated process of randomly generating orders and place those orders into a queue to be serviced. That queue also resides inside the database. Uh, there's a bunch of other processes that then read that queue and either request manufacturing of, of some components or order components, or if we've got all of the parts, assemble it. And so these there's are just a series of worker tasks that run and try and look like a real business process with clients connecting in and placing orders and having those orders fulfilled. So even with our monolithic version of the app, it's fairly a clean app. The, um, it is a well, I think, developed app. Kudos to you. And if you go back to an unsponsored video that or content that I did with Miles Ward, I'll link it uh, in the show notes below. We talked about, you know, he has a team of 400 or so consultants that have seen 3,300 different use cases and variations. So this isn't meant to be a absolute roadmap to how you modernize an application. I don't think there's such a thing exists. This is more of an effort to show you that Google's tooling either works, doesn't work, or something in between. It, it's just a level of effort. It's what is insight into our application that we completely understand and the value that Infit and the other tooling brought to the CTO Advisor hybrid infrastructure. So, Al, tell me, what what is your expectation or was your expectation for Infit? And well, I guess a, a step back, what is it? What does it do? So the objective with Infit is to look at your on-premises environment, discover what you have in terms of virtual machines and physical machines, and discover what's installed. And then do the mapping analysis of what you've got might work on these uh, Google Cloud services. And it produces a couple of reports. One is, is the one that, that Keith, I'd, I'd hand to you, which says out of our estate of however many hundred um, servers that we have, this many of them are going to be easy to move and these, these many are going to be harder to move. That's, that's the bit that I give to my executive and, and say, this is the scale of project we're working on. And then there's a second report that it produces, which says this particular candidate for movement, this Obsidian virtual machine, here are the platforms you could migrate to, and here's the amount of effort required. Um, take a VMware virtual machine, put it onto the Google VMware engine, very little effort required. It's just a, 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 a migration across. Whereas taking that Obsidian machine and putting it into uh, onto Google, the uh, Kubernetes engine, right, into containers, well, that's, there's a blocker on that. The original report said there are about four different blockers you need to fix before it's ready to go onto, onto GKE, and I really like that. And it said, here are the blockers, and, and it assesses. If you're going to go to this platform, it's this amount of work. If you're going to go to Cloud Run, well, actually, it's not going to fit on Cloud Run because that big monolithic machine is too large to run in Cloud Run. So it gives you this collection, and, and I really like that, this collection of different locations that you could migrate this application to and an indication of the effort and the specific items. And that's, that report is the one that goes to the engineering planning team who are saying, we're going to migrate these applications in this order. We know the dependencies between our applications, so we're going to get them in the right order. Um, and Keith, I think this starting to get complicated is a really important aspect here. Where you've got large numbers of applications, this is going to be complicated. You're going to need to slowly build the expertise. So the sorts of things that we're showing in this migration of Obsidian and uh, when I do the Granite migration, these are the beginning steps as you build some knowledge and expertise inside the organization that's migrating. You should expect to have to walk before you run. But progressively, you build out these skills and these processes that help you migrate the application using some of the migration tools that Google provides, uh, but potentially also using application migration tools. It doesn't have to be Google provided tools, but this report gives you that structure around how difficult different things are gonna to be to move to different platforms. And you'll probably choose different platforms and different changes for each of those applications. So this is the meat kind of the project. What we described or the what we talked to Google about was how do we get to factory mode? Mm. Basically, the ability to alleviate one of the biggest challenges, and this is what I 
hinted to in the introduction video of developers. I can't take my developers off of building net new capability to go back and retrofit legacy applications for the public cloud so that IT infrastructure, IT platform can save money or better run legacy infrastructure. That's not typically the big business value of cloud, not initially at least. We eventually get there, but the problem has to be solved. So for me, this project was a question of, is this something that I can eventually prototype to get to a factory mode, that process you just talked about of building the muscle, building the capability within my engineering and ops team to manage the migration of, you know, let's be realistic. You're not going to mag migrate every app without developer assistance, but can we knock out a good chunk of it? Can we make a difference? And I think we, we, we got some insights to share. So let's talk about that migration process. Hmm. What was day two after running the MFIT assessment from the engineer perspective? So coming off the, the MFIT assessment, the logical first thing to do is, is pick an app that, that's going to be require some effort to migrate onto a, a more native platform. And, and that's when you we were choosing Obsidian beforehand, the monolithic one. And out of the MFIT report, it said, here are some changes that need to be made to make it suitable. And I, I looked at the set of changes and, and some of them I decided to, to make in place before migration. So for example, because the ap application had been migrated from a distributed application to a monolithic application, it previously used an NFS share for some of the distributed processing. Well, the migration tool said, this is a, a red flag for several of the platforms. It'll require additional configuration. I just looked at, well, let's resolve out that technical debt of having taken a distributed application and made it monolithic. And let's just use a, a, a symbolic link instead of doing a, a loopback NFS mount. Right, so there was that, and there was a, I made a change to the SQL configuration, the, the MySQL configuration, in order to enable replication later on. So there were some small changes that I made before migrating. And then I used the um, migrate tool that will actually replicate your virtual machine. So replicate from on-premises vSphere it directly into the Google Compute Engine. So the first proof point for me was completing that replication and standing up a copy, a test copy of uh, Obsidian on Google Compute Engine while the production copy was still running on-premises. So that was my first proof point of the migration process. Now, if we're getting to factory mode, that test is, is probably going to be redundant if we've done sufficient um, previous processes successfully. And of course, you can always fail back. So the, at, at production line, you're just going to go straight through and stand it up because it's, it is nice and if we If we have our traditional V2V processes, we're strong in them. The only thing that, and I, I would argue that we're not even adding anything new here. When we did P to V's, we run assessments to find out what would break if there was any hardware drivers or uh, things, uh, not even just hardware drivers, integration into hardware, like uh, compact tooling installed on a server yeah. that would get yeah. migrated. We knew to run some process that would remove or deactivate those services, move them over, V to V or P to V, and now V to V. This is a solved thing. We know this part of the process from historically migrating tens of thousands of physical or virtual machines to either the cloud or virtualized environments. Now, let's talk about that next step. What's different? What we, we've, we've taken the application, we've moved it to our virtual private cloud or uh, private cloud network, public cloud network. What, what, what's next? So the, the next flag that MFIT had brought up, and I actually ran MFIT again to do an assessment of what I'd migrated onto Google Compute Engine so you can use it again. Uh, the next thing that it flagged up was that I was running MySQL. And it said, you know, you should migrate this to Cloud SQL. It said, it was absolutely in, in several of the destinations, it said, one of the things you need to do is migrate the database to Cloud SQL. So that was the next thing I did. Cloud SQL is a, a SQL database server as a service that, that um, GCP provides. And so this is why I'd made a change to the database engine before I started the replications, because uh, I needed 
the database engine to be configured for replication as well. And so I use the, the migration for Google um, Cloud Eng uh, sorry, Cloud SQL. Uh, I use that migration tool, which essentially sets up um, Active Standby replication. So my replicated SQL engine inside my Obsidian machine was replicated to Cloud SQL. And then I just pushed a button to switch it over, changed the DNS record that told my application where to find its database. And the application was then running on Cloud SQL. So that took the database engine out. That's actually pretty cool. I mean, that in itself, uh, how many times have we gotten into problems with ownership of a monolith where the DBA said I needed to do something and the app owner said there's no way you can do that or vice versa. Yeah. And now we've literally separated that responsibility in an automated way. And we've taken away the requirement to manage an operating system and a database engine, and we're just now managing the database. And so, yeah, I, I like moving to some of these as a service delivery. This is how, even without changing my monolithic application, we could get some of the benefits of being on a, on a um, cloud platform because we don't have to manage as much. Again, we hand over that uh, regular routine work to somebody who's turned it into a manufacturing process. And this is where I talked about, well, we're not nearly to auto scaling. We're starting to lay the infrastructure for auto scaling. We've removed the dependency that that mapping of the monolith of the database being in the VM. If you've managed the production environment at any scope, we typically almost always have to increase the resources given to a monolith because of the database. Now we can right size the, the infrastructure. And this is where we're starting to see some of the cost savings, even though we're still running in a VM, we can shrink the size of the VM and now start to use the native cloud services. Yeah, yeah. And, and this is the idea of, of you, you move the application and then you improve the application. And, and the simple migration into place is seldom the best solution. Uh, usually there is some way to improve the application and your best value and bus business value comes from that improvement. But also as you, s you start looking at your application, you may be saying, well, we've got to add on to our existing monolith. Our existing monolith isn't good for mobile and web applications, but it's where all our data is. And so you may not actually plan to change the monolith, but you're moving to cloud because you need the agility to build all of the other support components around it. And it, you're probably going to build those support components in a way that is, or these new platforms in a way that is cloud native, even if you leave the monolith in place. That, that may be where the business value is from that agility around the monolith. So let's finish talking about the migration of the monolith. What, what was next? So the, the next thing was to take a look at moving the monolith from a virtual machine into a container using the Google, Google Kubernetes engine. And I did this two different ways because there's two different flavors of the, of the Google Kubernetes engine. The first thing was that it said that building your own um, compute hosts, your own, your own um, worker nodes, uh, will let you have the most flexibility about resources because this is a big monolith. Even taking the database out, it's using a lot of memory and a lot of CPU. And so I did that migration into a GKE cluster that was built inside my account and that I was managing. And that went really nicely. And, and then the team at, at, um, at Google who were, we were working with said, well, why don't you try um, GKE Autopilot? Actually, <laughs> somebody tweeted the same thing at me. So I thought, okay, let's try that. And now it's a um, cluster that's, that's the Kubernetes cluster that I don't have to care so much about. And the resources underneath are, are much more automatically provisioned. Now, this is where the resource constraints became an issue because Initially, the recommendation was don't take this to autopilot because it needs more resources than autopilot likes to deliver. And uh, so taking the SQL engine out reduces the resource requirements. Now, I need to do some testing to make sure I'm getting enough performance out of, of uh, autopilot and that I've configured things correctly. And there was just a, a little space for improvement on that process of MFIT going through to, um, through to the autopilot uh, migration was that there wasn't quite enough information being passed on it. In particular, the amount of resources that I needed on the container running uh, in GKE hadn't come through from Infit. It would be nice to have a little bit more integration where it says, at source side, it used this much resource. How much resource do you want to have at the, the destination side? 
Um, and the product teams have now started talking because I suggested that. <laughs> yeah, I love uh, one of the things that we wanted to probe in our experience is that we've heard big that Google Cloud and Google in general doesn't listen to feedback from uh, their customers. And I think we found quite the opposite. They were very anxious to hear our feedback. I don't know if that's unique because we're doing this sponsored project and it, we're putting it out there. But in general, the uh, you know when I talk to their evangelists and their advocates, in general, they, they seem to really want to make the, the product and tools better. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely see people who are enthusiastic and excited about what their products do and that are realistic. So one of the comments I made is I found that the documentation is difficult because it's documentation written so that a single document covers every possible use case. And I find that really hard because you've got to identify the track that actually maps to your, your path. And um, when there are so many different ways you can use these tools, the documentation gets to be a little cumbersome with that. And, uh, so this is a little bit why I've been starting to, to write up procedurals of this is the exact path to follow if this is your very common start point and this is your very common end point. Yeah, we, we sometimes forget that we're in a fast moving part of the industry. We have the conference, me and you have been in the enterprise data center side of the house for years, and there's very prescriptive recipes for almost every mm. use case, whether it was created by the vendor that's products that we're using, or if it's simply community driven content and we can just find a recipe, you know, you're, you're famous for your recipe for building and tearing down VMware vSphere environments is kind of a, a, a solve solution. We haven't gotten to that point yet. Yeah, I think that there's on, on public cloud, there's much more of an expectation there'll be expertise in building and and and, um, and understanding your, your uniqueness. And I think that's one of the things that hooks back to that, um, that uh, podcast that you did was that there was that 3000 plus snowflake items that it'll all be moved, right? They expect that you will have snowflakes to move and moving snowflakes is, is perfectly normal as you migrate onto Google. So we've talked a lot about the what we've done technically in the process. I think people are getting the gist of what the tooling enables you to do, but let's talk about subjectively. Subjectively, is this something that can be come a factory? Like the, do I need, what's the level of skill that I need operating at this level when we're doing the assessment of applications? Do I need a, somebody with deep development expertise or given the application state that we, or slate that we worked with, is this something that, you know, the, the SRE type of resource can do? So I think the, the phase of discovering the information is very simple. Um, the knowing what to do with that information and do the migration is the place where you're gonna to need to build some skills and expertise. And so a large organization is either gonna build it in-house or buy it in, but there needs to be that ramp up in skills and experience. You are going to be using um, pretty skilled engineers to work out a good path to migrate without large outage and impact. And this is the sort of place where if you start doing things wrong, things will go very badly for you. If you don't identify that there is a critical dependency between different applications that you're using and you migrate one and haven't identified how the other one is going to talk to it, those are the kind of enterprise architecture and enterprise connectivity, or at least at the um, technical architecture uh, levels that you're still going to need. Right. Moving to the cloud doesn't remove the need for both enterprise and technical architecture. It just makes application architecture even more important. Yeah, when I was talking to Miles Ward, I get that impression that, yes, this is something that enterprises can tackle on their own. The tooling really helps, but this is a problem of scale and availability and, and experience. Uh, mm. you were extremely experienced in both the Obsidian and the Granite app. So 
you when the report ran and you and it said to change these things, you knew exactly where to go and where to change and had an ideal of the impact. I think organizations won't initially be able to move that fast because they don't are or, or at least they're trying not to use developer resources. So there's a lot more testing. There's a lot more validation. There's a lot more steady state moving. Let's talk about the future in a couple of ways. We can't talk about public cloud without talking about serverless and cloud run. Did we get to play with serverless and cloud run at all? So I haven't yet played with cloud run because Obsidian is this big monolithic application doesn't suit it. But Granite with its distributed nature some of the virtual machines that make up Granite were recommended for migrating to Cloud Run. So the smaller, more transient workloads that suit serverless platforms. In, in particular, I, I could see some real benefits as the developer of the application, I could see some real benefits of moving towards serverless and just having to have, there's, there's a, a scheduler component in there and actually using a pre-built scheduler rather than having to write my own, that is really appealing. And so, I think in terms of future, this path from having separate operations team and development team is really at odds with the DevOps movement that we're seeing, where those two teams come together and they look after a particular application. This is the thing that, that really is important towards enabling this public cloud use case and use of these cloud services is the operations and the development teams coming together. And that's essentially what SRE and DevOps is about, is holistic ownership of the application from development to operations, rather than these siloed teams where the developers throw the application code over the cliff uh, and the operations team really aren't very involved in the development. Yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of exploding my mind right now because there's a ton of things we haven't talked about. We haven't talked about observability. We haven't talked about uh, break fix. So that, that SRE model, we haven't talked about application lifecycle development, CI, CD processes, all these new technologies and, and processes and, and, and people skills that's needed to manage cloud that's at odds with how we've managed applications in the past. And this whole transi transition from one model to another, and in some cases, if we're being honest, we're going to have both it may not be a transition. It may be that we have this legacy monolithic approach because we deemed it too hard or not worth the effort to even use these tools yeah. to migrate. Absolutely. So that that idea that you're going to put the effort where there's business benefit, that's, that's absolutely fundamental. And so there will be times when you'll just pick up your monolith and, and move it and say, you know, I need it close to the, the new stuff where there's business benefit to me, me spending that money. But I don't get a lot of benefit out of changing this, right? It still runs my manufacturing plant the way it has run my manufacturing plant for the last 20 years. I don't need to change that. I need to change the way I take my orders in and drive that manufacturing plant, but I don't need to change how the manufacturing plant runs. So yeah, absolutely, there will be this coexistence until there's some mass extinction event, and the last one was Y2K, um, these things are gonna hang around. They're not gonna go, these applications that we've sunk a lot of effort into building business processes into code, they're not going to go away just because there's a new way of building business process into code that's quicker and better. So I, I always love teaming with you. You're the brain beyond uh, behind my architecture and you, you really help put meat behind this. For those who want to find your organization's content, where can they do that? So my own personal site is on demitas.co.nz, like the small cup of coffee that I drink from. Uh, but I put content out in a variety of different places. There's, there's some of the content for this is on builddaylive.com, where I work with, with yourself on some projects as well as with Jeffrey Powers. And, and that's the, the hands-on technical procedural stuff. Uh, whereas on my Demitas blog, you're more likely to see the more conceptual components. Uh, I did a series recently on on how to think differently about building applications on public cloud. It was targeted at a different public cloud, but the, the learnings are exactly the same. 
Uh, and then also I'm very involved with the V Brown Bag crew and the V Brown Bag podcast. And so vbrownbag.com is another place to go and find lots of content, not so much of mine, but content that I've uh, enabled other people to create that is again targeted at the hands-on engineer. And if you want to find out more about the CTO advisor or this project that we want, if this is the only video that you've seen from the session, there's two other ones. And there's some great references that we're building. It is a living page. Uh, we eventually will put out a sort of run book or framework for cloud migration to basically open source and give to the community. You can find that thectoadvisor.com, and I'm sure Al will link it on his various channels as well. If you want to find out more about me, you can find me on the web or on Twitter at CTO Advisor. Stay tuned for more content where it's constantly coming out. Thanks.